live from Red Feather Studios, it's the most controversial film podcast on the air. I don't give a flick. And hey, everybody, welcome to another episode of I Don't Give a Flick. I am, well, one of your hosts, Johnny Blackburn, and alongside me this week, as he is unfortunately every week i can't fucking shake this guy he it's like the lost puppy that won't leave you alone uh gary elmore's back ladies and gentlemen give him a round of applause thank you thank yeah. you so much i appreciate it oh wow yeah yeah don't don't be excited or anything you know i mean we, we haven't believe we, me we, i'm not <laughs> you're such a dick we haven't we haven't done an episode in a month and this is the level of excitement i get this is it oh what the fuck man uh neil riley will not be joining us this week guys unfortunately as you all know he is the uh new father of a bouncing baby boy and he is on daddy duty tonight so we wish him well and we will see him next week uh but this week we are very very privileged to have with us uh the ceo of bang productions uh a hollywood executive producer mr john edmonds cosma john thank you so much for joining us tonight glad to be here man glad yeah to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so for, for those of you that uh, tuned in with us a few weeks ago, we had talked about doing an episode basically on social media in entertainment, uh, how it affects really every aspect from um, people becoming famous, you know, becoming a celebrity to uh, finding work in that industry, um, to advertising, to marketing, to everything that there is to do with that media content. We're going to dive into that tonight. Uh, John is a, is a, a bit of a, a, a guru and he's, he's an expert. He's been doing this for quite some time. So uh, he's the perfect guest for us to join in on this adventure with. And so we're excited. Uh, John, I want to jump into it. Um, for our listeners that aren't familiar with uh, you and your work, why don't you give them a little background about um, how you kind of got to where you're at now, um, who you who you currently manage and what your company does, things like that. I mean, we're, you know, I, I came out of television and I got pissed off at, at the industry a little bit because okay. I developed... I don't know. I developed a thousand shows and sold three. Okay. Um, and then when I turned to social media, I, I realized that if I gave social media value, which people don't give value to social media and utilize the tools the right way, I could create my own network. Um, so with that being said, that was I think that's seven years ago when we started this journey, when I discovered Southern Mama, Darren Knight. And create a blueprint and now we're we're one of the biggest publishers on social media we reach about 100 million people a month um we're one of 30 companies in the world that's a uh, partner with meta i mean mm -hmm. our company's on the facebook website um you know the studio 71's on there which is a mark cuban company put in 100 million dollars and actually i think we rank higher than that we're kind of uh we just I, tr I try to make money. I don't sell the vapor. I mean, we're not, our company is more known for comedy and changing the comedy industry. Uh -huh. I took a guy from a trailer, trailer park or a trailer in the middle of the Talladega National Forest mm -hmm. uh, to just for laughs, the Super Bowl of comedy with my blueprint I created by Discovery uh, on social media. And as a first, we were, you know, oh. I was the one who created the radio edits uh we i started the radio edits on social media in 2016 really uh, yes i was the first guy to do that then everybody else tried to copy me um and yeah it was all by discovery and here we are today well you know they say that imitation is the greatest form of flattery so <laughs> hey, you must there be you very go. flattered <laughs> You know, I mean, I'm the type of guy, you know what, I forgot, I forgot everything I've done. I, I wouldn't say I forgot everything I've done, but, you know, I live, you know, every day is a new day. I forgot yesterday, you know, and whatever's in front of me, that's, that's how I live, you know, so I don't try to live off, you know, things I've accomplished behind me, if you will. Mm -hmm, right. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, no, I mean, absolutely. So, uh, so I, I guess your would you say your your biggest client is currently Darren Knight, Southern Mom? Is is that that's probably accurate? I would say. Um, I mean, you know, we have a couple different levels of, uh, I guess, levels of business. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of touring. Um, 
we just uh, brought in Ashley Gutermuth, uh, who is going to be a military spouse of the year. She's in our camp. She, her and Robin Phoenix. Okay. Uh, she's, I think she's going to be the next Ellen. And she's very clean, so I'm very excited about really? that. Because um, mm-hmm. um, it's a different, a different direction. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, then, and then Southern Mama. But as far as managing pages, I mean, I've worked with you know, King Kieran to Brittany Furland. Uh, you know, we've managed and built pages for multiple people, you know, Ginger Billy, Catfish Cooley. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a ton. I built, I basically built Southern comedy on social media. I mean, we basically built the whole market. Yeah. So it kind of just, so getting into that, I guess that's kind of a good segue. Um, can you kind of bring us along with, you know, when, how did you discover, how did you discover Darren? Um, how did you build him, his career up basically as, from what I read, it was a meteoric rise. I, I, I had read that and he was one of the, of the fastest growing comedians of all time. And, yeah. you know, of course, and thanks to you, it sounds like. Um, so how did that process go? How did you use social media to, to boost him above the other comedians that he was competing against? Well, when, when I, well, when I first got into comedy, I, I mean, I looked at the comedy industry and no, no, you know, I'm not trying to beat up the industry or anything. I just looked at it from a business standpoint. And I think because I didn't know the rules of comedy, I did business how I thought I should be able to do business. And what I realized is, you know, they, they're kind of on a dinosaur model. So if you want to be a comedian, you know, all right, go start gigging. And you're going to do five to seven shows a week, you know, so, or five to seven days a week do shows. So if you're starting out your first week, you know, 50 people show up to that show. And let's say that they, they have no idea who they're coming to see. And let's say you pull two or three fans out of that first show. And that progression, you know, you do for the next two or three years, pulling two or three people out because nobody knows who you know, they're coming to see, and you think, look at the growth of the industry, you know, the, the, the growth potential of that is a long time, you know, because if I can go create a, a video, right, and put it out to the world and start bringing in people that can relate to that video that is relatable to their life, you know, the, the, the three there are three types of content I look at is relate, relatability, uh, educational, and entertaining. So you can hit bigger numbers, build an audience quicker, build a career quicker if you have the right talent um, and, and know who's paying. You know, and I think the industry forgot who's paying the bills, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Because the other thing I saw in industry was that the comedians were trying to appease industry Mm -hmm. and not really thinking about who's paying for the industry. Right. So if you're trying to build a fan base and you're communicating with a certain type of tone, right. You know, tone is like who you hang out with. Like if you have a tone, usually you hang out with friends who have a very similar tone. Right. So if you put that tone out to the world, and you and you're a great talent and in tone always works right you can garner a fan base quicker you know in one location than compared to gigging you know seven days a week and taking you 10 years to build a career so it sounds like you're using kind of a uh a real analytical model in terms of like almost doing a market study on what the audience would be interested in kind of tailoring to meet that. Would that be? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Way? You shoot a wide net, you shoot a wide net, right. And you, you bring back, bring in that data. You start building a foundation, a fan mm-hmm. base, right. You shoot a mm-hmm. wide net, start analyzing that data. And then you say, all right, my biggest, let's say if you take a hundred percent of data, and I look at the very top demographic. So let's say your demographic is 25 to 34. And it's a, a, a female, whatever. So let's, let's home in on that top 20%, right? And cater to that 20% on how we create content. Because if you cater to that pure source, then everything else is a win, right? So, and, and then you, you, know, you use the data to build a career. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. Like, because sensitivity, you know, what people don't realize, if you reverse engineer social media, it's social media is created based on human experience and human sensitivities. So just reverse engineer that thought process and understand how the system is created. Right. It's a, you know, it's, it's fairly simple to me, but nobody's ever really understood what I do. Also, it seems like you're using sort of the, the, the power of the uh, analytical tools that uh, come with social media these kind of days. So like, you know, on Facebook or uh, you know, what have you, they'll, they'll be able to really kind of cut that uh, uh, market down into really specific and accurate and, uh, you know, real time updates of like who's on, who's watching, you know, what they're clicking on, you know, how long their eyeballs stay on a particular topic. So it seems like you're kind of taking that information and using that to, to data drive your it's people. More about, it's more about human response mm -hmm. and law of attraction. So if you understand law of attraction, defining law of attraction, and then you look at human response and you look at your biggest percentage of response and you double down on that percentage and that's a pure source, your growth potential is exponential compared mm -hmm. to dropping droplets of comedy around the world and see who responds. You know, like I said, it's it's. Because everybody's not going to respond. You know, comedy is subjective. And, you know, some, some comedians don't, you know, get a response from a certain type of personality. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's basically reverse engineering the whole system and creating a growth rate with a pure source, you know. Because, because once you build that fan base, right, when you look at the business part, of it, once you build that fan base and you start selling tickets for a show, they already like you. So then it's just a numbers game if you have the right talent. Now, I will preface this. You know, you know the industry got burned because, you know, they, they jumped out there and started picking up people. You know, Hollywood got burned because they picked up people who, who had big numbers, but they didn't understand how to pick out the right person that could translate the camera or the stage. Mm -hmm. And that's where a little bit of the uh narratives got altered a little bit with social media because they got burnt now they didn't make the right choices but if you can it takes talent first no matter it takes talent first the right talent finding the right talent first for me to do what i do but if you know how to find that right right talent and then put put my uh system i call it finding a perfect audience put my system to the right talent then the gross the growth is exponential and you mm -hmm. can do this with anything. You can do this with a business. You can do this with a brand. You know, you just got to understand how to communicate with content. So if there is there one specific thing that you could like if uh, could give our audience where you were like, when I'm trying to make someone go big and I'm trying to make them blow up through social media, is there one thing in particular that you attribute the success to? Well, if you find the right talent. Oh, sure. And and you understand how to read the data and create the right content, you know, then it's just mm -hmm. consistency. Consistencies don't, you know, don't get thrown off the track by bullshit. Because if you've, if you understand uh, the talent, you understand the type of uh, fan base they're building to stay consistent. Mm -hmm. You know, algorithms don't matter because you're out front of the algorithm at that point. If that makes sense, this consistency, you know, mm -hmm. if you find a path and how to communicate with somebody with content, be very consistent and you'll be successful. Sure. Don't yeah. listen to bullshit. Don't listen to the bullshit because most narratives you see uh, out there that are, out, you know, out in the marketplace are usually six to 12 months behind by the time they hit print. So if you don't understand how social media moves from a feel standpoint through mm -hmm. the data in real time, then you're lost and stay out of the articles. Use the articles as an outline, but your discovery, you know, everybody's discovery is different based on what, what percentages you're dealing with um, in the process. Does that make sense to y'all? <laughs> yeah, 
I, I mean, yeah, uh, relatively. Yeah, I guess. He's like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, whoa, mine's swimming. Yeah. Um, yeah. So basically, if, if from what I'm hearing, I guess with that is that your process is um, to uh, not. You, you kind of want to be closer to the uh, the bleeding edge of whatever the the culture is doing. So, as you said, kind of don't not, be. It's like, not about the culture. Mm-hmm. It's about it's about relatability, right? So, if if you can communicate and make something very relatable mm-hmm. from the right piece of talent, right? By law of attraction, people are going to gravitate to that content, no matter what. People are going to respond to that content because they're attracted to it, basically. And if you, you know, and once you find your avatar, once you find your avatar, once you find your fans that are relating to your content, then you're cooking with gas. It's all about simple relations. It's not as, it's not about culture. It's not about anything. It's just being relatable to a part of the world, right? That's going to resonate with that, you know, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and people, People have, you know, there's different types and groups of people, and those different types of people and groups are going to be attracted to different relations, <clears throat> right? So, so when you break that down, the more relatable to the masses, the bigger fan base you can build, right? So when you make, try to make, when you're communicating and trying to make it complicated, your build will be a lot slower because mm. everybody's not going to relate to it. People want to be able to relate to something immediately, how they live their life, you know, is basically the, the big thing. It's like Southern mama, you know, act like the Southern mama. Very simple right. relations, you know, how, the, how, he, how Southern mamas raise kids, you know, and, and that resonated. And he was able to do it in a very simple way which, you know, made him who he was. Okay. So kind of stay on, uh, on brand is what you're saying. So when you uh, find a talent that is resonating with these people, um, keep them on brand. Don't let them like uh, try and like hate or appeal to everyone. Veer well, I don't, I don't try to one thing. Another thing I did in industry is like most, most producers will come in and find a talent and they will try to recreate their narrative. Mm-hmm. That's why there's a bunch of bad television out there because it's not relatable to anybody because you have producers that was an intern, mm-hmm. started out as an intern, 20 years later, they're running the network and they're trying to tell you what people like and they know nothing about life. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's the same principle. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's the same. It's, a, it's the same principle, you know. Okay. So it would almost... I guess kind of going off of that thought process, maybe be more successful to just instead of having a producer that's been doing it 20 years, just kind of pick a random person off the street because they're still. I'm sorry, I left out a part. So how I approached it, right? Mm -hmm. I said, I'm going to create an outline. I'm going to give you a stage, right? I'm going to help you with timing, right? You be real. You feel that that you feel that outline in I created Mm -hmm. with who you are, you know, and who you are. And that's, you know, I never tried to dilute his narrative. I never tried to rewrite his narrative. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, so I I basically, I reverse engine everything I do. I reverse engineer, you know, maybe I'm dyslexic or whatever, but (laughs) that, you know, that's what, that's how I'm, I'm, Built what I've built by reverse engineering everything. I went opposite of what the industry was doing. Yeah, it worked. So how did you how did you find how did you find Darren? What what ended up happening there? How were you all introduced? I saw a video. I was I was just I just partnered with a big showrunner, Chris Case. Uh-huh. Uh, he had a big show, thirty five and over, home and thirty five and over on TV Land, and we just partnered, and we were going to start developing projects and at the time a friend of mine signed um the liberal redneck 
what was his name? Okay. Um, <laughs> liver redneck. Uh, yeah, I, and, I don't remember his name, but I recall yeah. I recall him. Yeah. And and then I was scouring. I saw one video of Darren uh, online, and at, at the time I was like, hmm. And it was about him at the damn flea market. I said, this son of a bitch is funny. Because there was a trend with the liberal redneck and what was going on. They were trying to build shows at that time, a trend. What yeah. was going on? I said, somebody missed this guy. So I pitched him to actually other managers in comedy. And they're like, he doesn't need a manager. He's five years out. And then I was like, screw it. I said, we'll just sign him and do everything. And went to work. And then, you know, seven years later, we've done 10 million in business. We did we did six hundred thousand in business the from I signed him June twenty fourth of mm-hmm. twenty sixteen. By the end of the year we grow six hundred thousand. And we've uh, we're over ten million today. Not too shabby. <laughs> and then, and that and that was from scratch. Yeah. I didn't borrow a dime from anybody. Just taking wow. the formula that you or you kind yeah. of been working on and applying it there. Okay. Yes, absolutely. And then, and then I did, I never knew I had intelligence. So I, I never knew I had intelligence in tech until I started talking to tech people. Mm-hmm. And then that's how I became a, a, a partner with Meta because they would, I would have whole departments reach out like the live event department would reach out to me and I would note out the department and tell them what they're doing wrong. And I never knew I had that intelligence stuff started dealing in the tech world. Man. So when, uh, so I guess, how, how long have you been in the entertainment industry altogether? When did you first get your start? How long ago? Uh, I mean, I modeled, you know, in, in my early 20s. Okay. Uh, I did the corporate thing, I think, from uh-huh. when I got out of college from 25 to 32. I was making $150,000 a year, and I didn't like it, and I... Uh, walked away and went to make fifty thousand dollars a year at thirty two, and bought a camera <laughs> and started walking around filming shit and just you know started started closed a couple music videos, yeah, um, and started there and just built from there. Yeah, but you, had, you mm-hmm. yeah, go ahead. No, I was just saying. I was just saying. Yeah, you you you. But you woke up in the morning and you were excited to go to work. You know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> make substantially less and still love what and you're doing. Fear, you know, I think fear fear keeps you in place, right? Like, if, mm-hmm. if you need to do what your passion is, no matter how hard it is, do your passion. What comes from the heart, and whatever you say, whether people like it or not, you know, you got to hit them in the mouth because people mm-hmm. don't like the truth. But if you operate that way, you eliminate a lot of bullshit and you'll move quicker through business by having that mindset. Yeah. So, so, so yeah, I mean, so since it sounds like you've, you've been in the industry, obviously, for, for a few decades at this point. So when did you, I guess, kind of before social media became prevalent and kind of took over for everything, what did you see people doing to market themselves? What did you see directors and actors and, and so forth? Um, what, did, what did they do to get their to get their name out there? Like, how is how is it different than today? Well. You know, it was, uh, you know, a big thing with publicists. I never understood publicists, uh-huh. you know, because publicists would want five, ten thousand 10,000 a month. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I'm paying you five, t- 10,000 a month, but where's my conversion? Where's my return? Right. Yeah. And, and I would tell people, why am I spending this money if nobody's writing me a check? Mm-hmm. Right? People got to write a check. So if you, you know, and until this day, I hit people in the mouth with that all the time. I'm like, dude, I'm not running around here doing business on bullshit or vapor, you know. And I had to go through some very like for a while. I trusted, you know, for a while in my career, you know, I was partners with Nick Cassavetes, right? Oh, cool. I raised a million dollars with a project with Nick Cassavetes, paid him four hundred thousand oh. dollars to write a script. When he was doing My Sister's Keeper mm-hmm. with Cameron Diaz, you know, having lunch with them and hanging out with these people, Cameron Diaz and yeah. all this stuff didn't mean shit. I mean, I can remember driving down Sunset Boulevard, had an office in the Taft building, corner of um, Hollywood and Vine. Mm-hmm. It was Nick Jagger's old office. 
And I can remember <laughs> driving down Sunset and looking up at the sign and say, when I parked with Nick, I said, I made it. Hmm. And he, he never did what he was said he was going to do. We never made the movie. Right. So, I, you know, I left L.A. in 2008, broke, couldn't pay my July of 2008, left L.A., broke, couldn't pay my rent, moved to New Jersey and rebuilt from zero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was, a, you know, that's a life changing experience. Yeah. End of 2008 was a great time to, uh, you know, have to rebuild everything, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good timing. Good timing. Yeah. Really, really great timing. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, because people, people believe in the, the hype. Just because mm -hmm. somebody, hey, just because somebody's a big star, that big star is never going to write you a check. I promise mm -hmm. you. They, a big star is going to want more out of you than anything else. Yeah, and I think that's, uh, it sounds like that's one of the uh, benefits of the system that you kind of have, um, yeah. because you find talent, as you said, that have uh, uh, a je ne sais quoi to them that's, that's needed, and you help them find the market that they need, and they, in turn, uh, you know, bring in revenue for you, so you have a much more kind of symbiotic relationship that sounds yeah. like it's more open. Well, it goes back to self worth, right? Yeah. You you know, artists think they gotta meet this guy, meet this guy. That don't really mean shit. You gotta find yourself. You find yourself first. Once you find yourself and, and go with your passion, mm -hmm. you'll be more successful because if you can create value for yourself, they will come. Mm-hmm. And you'll save a lot of time chasing down a bunch of knuckleheads that you think can help your career. If that makes sense. Because when I created value with, with Southern Mama and we built numbers the right way and we sold out 150 shows in a row, everybody's at the front door. I didn't have to find them. They found me. Yeah. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. Um, so just uh, in, in terms of like Southern Mama and, you know, the other, uh, you know, projects you got going have you kind of seen like uh, I, I assume those like sold out shows kind of took a dip during covid have they kind of come back around yeah well you know that's that's the other thing industry i think misses because if something has a dip they they cut it yeah but if you realize tone if you find a tone that works with the masses that tone will always work and you see that playing out now, right? You see that playing out now because you have these TV shows coming back. Music, you know, these old songs are becoming hits again, right? Because that tone worked, mm -hmm. right? So that's a, that's a big deal that I don't think people really understand. So now, you know, we had a little bit of a law, but, you know, this year, I mean, we're doing the, you know, we're in Houston, we're doing the Cullen Performing Arts Center, you know, oh, we're great. doing you know, we're doing the, the Majestic downtown Dallas, you know, and these are big venues. They're like 2,000 seaters, and we're still filling them up. Yeah, that's that's wonderful to hear. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, I like it. Yeah, I, I agree that, like, you know, there'll be dips and ebbs and flows and everything, but um, like, like Shakespeare, for example, like his plays still resonate with people because they're timeless values, you know, so you got to stick with them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's like, you know, look at the bands, the great bands that when they broke up, they didn't do shit yeah. after they broke up. Mm. Because that those guys, even though they had some issues internally or whatever it is, but with those guys together, that tone worked. Mm. And I don't, think, I don't think, I think people's egos get in the way in those situations, right? And, yeah. and yes, it. absolutely. <laughs> and it, and it hits their, you know, and, and by default, it hits their checkbook. Mm -hmm. And they don't, they don't realize that while their ego is swinging around to make that dumb decision. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you like, know what I mean? Yeah, and if people could just, you know, put their egos aside and realize, hey, what we're doing here is a job, a job to entertain people or, you know, what have you. Um, I I think you'd see a lot less issues with, like, especially, like, yeah, uh, you know, bands that break up, those kind of things. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You just got to, you know, I think you got to look at, you know, if you find a situation in entertainment that works, you know, put blinders on no matter how much you may hate somebody. If you're getting paid, especially in entertainment, stay with that situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, try to ride it out as far as you can. Obviously, there's a stopping point. You know, if there's 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 certain things that may happen where you can't continue. But if you can, don't let the ego get in the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so we were, we were talking about, you said back in the day that, you know, at least a few decades ago that, uh, publicists were a really good way to get your name out there, whether you're a, a comedian or an actor, director, writer, whatever it may be. Um, was there any other, was there any other way outside of just going to open casting call auditions and stuff? Was that, was there any other way people tried to market themselves like back, you know, really before the, the internet itself became prevalent in the two thousands and uh, social media actually exploded. Well, I think that, you know, when you had 10 people in the room making those decisions, it was very, very hard. Sure. Back yeah. in the day. And, and now that you can put yourself in front of the masses, <laughs> it's easier nowadays. That seems like, <laughs> yeah. And the casting call is already done for you. Right. Right. So if you, you know, th these are, these are, I look at social media as casting calls that are already set up for you. Okay. You know what I mean? And okay. that you didn't have that opportunity, you know, years ago, mm -hmm. it was, it was more about trying, trying to hustle, trying to, you know, trying to find somebody, put you in front of somebody because, yeah. you know, that five second spot on the tonight show back in the day was the home run for comedians. But We're today, old. yeah. Today, they do that five minutes on tonight's show and they can't sell a ticket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. You know, you know what I mean? They yeah. Don't, they don't on tonight's show five times, they still can't sell tickets. Yeah. Yeah. It seemed like for it seemed like for decades that the gateway to being a famous comedic actor, not even comedian, was SNL. Like if you didn't get on SNL, like you you weren't going to make it. You know, it wasn't well, we we saw we started to see people peel off, you know, when in the 2000s, obviously, that weren't on there. But but still. Yeah, it, it, I totally agree. Yeah, it's just it seems to be so much easier nowadays. I mean, the market is saturated. Don't get me wrong with more celebrities than than we've ever seen before. You know, um, it's it, it seems today it seems like back in we were when we were young, you know, like in the 2000s growing up and stuff when we were in school, someone was like, oh, did you hear about John Heater? You know, the guy who played Napoleon Dynamite. He's the newest hot actor. Everybody at the school had heard of him. Nowadays, if you have that actor out there, someone's like, oh, did you hear about blah, blah, blah? Your friend might be like, no, I haven't heard about him because there's so many people like him. The market there's the market is so saturated. There's so many people becoming famous now every week, daily, even. And it seems like nowadays, you know, um, I mean, do, do you feel like that, John? I mean, did you see like that trend? I mean, we are seeing it's the strength. It's, that is the strength and of, of identity. Mm hmm. And that was a, that was something I learned. That was some the strength of the strength of identity was something I learned too. Because when I developed these thousand shows and pitched all these shows, I could have the greatest idea in the world. And the only time I ever sold a show was when I had a, a, a good talent attached to a concept. Every single time, really? Wow. Yes. Okay. Huh. So That's got to be think frustrating. About, <laughs> yeah, yeah. When you think about the psychology of that. You know, like I used to work with Dipley back in 2016, 17, and oh. I looked at how they did content. They were one of the biggest websites on, you know, I think they were like 33 in the world at one time. But yeah, but I, I knew that they wouldn't survive on how they did their content because it was very mundane. It was very like DIY gardening mm -hmm. or whatever it is. So when you look at the, the psychology of that, there's no attraction to that. Right. And, and, and you and then now you fast forward today. So. you, oh Gosh, my wife is. My wife is like burning the house down, I think. So oh. I, I guess I just want to finish my thought on identity. You, you asked Please, about man. identity. So from a psychology standpoint, people resonate to identity. And that goes back to, you know, that relatability you know, build in relatability. So if you think of today, how studios um, market, right? It's, it's, and I, I, this is how I reverse engineer that understanding identity is you see Netflix when they market something, you first see Netflix, you see the name of the show 
and you see who's starring in the show. So in a way, they're diluting their marketing process instead of here's Kevin Hart who's starring in the show, right? Here's the name of the show, and this is who's this is the network is putting on the show because it doesn't matter where the show is. If they see Kev, if you're a fan of Kevin Hart and they see that up front, they're going to go see Kevin Hart no matter what network he's on. So in a way, sometimes I think they lose 20, you lose 20% of your, of people you could garner if they conveyed their marketing differently. Right. Yeah. And, and, my, and my process is going to eliminate marketing because marketing is just reactionary mm -hmm. you know, yeah. instead of data driven. Yeah. Cause nobody cares. Like if new line cinema makes something or if, uh, Fox Searchlight makes it, you know, they're like, oh, is, you know, Tom Cruise in it? Or, you know, yeah. like you were saying, because it's, yeah. uh, it, it's kind of like the, uh, that Hollywood uh, A-lister uh, mentality where mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're a big enough star to draw in uh, uh, an audience to make a project worthwhile. And I think you were kind of talking about that earlier when you said you had a bunch of really good ideas, but you didn't have anyone attached to them. So nobody yeah. was interested in them. And, I, you know, in everything I do, I had to learn in life because I didn't know the answers. Yeah. This there's no all experiences rule book, yeah. I had. Yeah. So going mm -hmm. back to your question, Johnny, I mean, it's, uh, it's, you know, the identity works. And you see that working. Sometimes you see it working too much on social media, <laughs> if you will. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. So is, is it possible nowadays to be famous or become a celebrity without a social media presence or influence at all what do you think no not at all okay you can be the great uh, you can be the greatest talent in the world right and unless you create something like a people that's going to pay you a bazillion dollars you know i mean that's a little different but if you don't bring numbers to the game you can no, you're gonna be the greatest talent in the world that nobody sees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, do you think that I guess the the draw of social media, um, since it's uh, overtaken, you know, normal the the old school marketing that people used to use, do you think that the draw of social media is because people can relate more with the the actors uh, behind it? So they're like, oh, uh, going back to Kevin Hart, like, oh, Kevin Hart, uh, he tweeted something funny a couple of weeks ago. So I feel like I know him a little bit more. So I want to see him. 100%. Okay. 100%. I mean, everybody wants that intimacy, mm -hmm. and, you know, and that's why you get comments like you do. And I don't understand people's, like, you know, mentality. If you have enough time to you know, talk shit on social media, then what's, what are you doing in the rest of your life? Right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? So, you know, there's an extreme in that, but yeah, the accessibility is a big deal. People want to look behind the curtain, mm -hmm. you know, and, that's, and, I, and, I, and I, I think now the new wave is, you know, and this is what I'm, I'm going to write in my book, finding a perfect audience. The new wave is creating a, you know, we've kind of, when I said we kind of hit a level of bullshit, and there's really nowhere else to, to go. There's no more narratives that can be created. So I think we're going to take a turn. And, and, you know, and now it's more about, I think, if you can create a position of influence, you know, create a position of influence. When I say create a position of influence, how big can you build your influence? How, how big can you, you know, build your universe where you can communicate to your own people within your universe? Right. And as long as you make content that's relatable, educational, and entertaining, right, you can sell those people a lot of stuff. And mm -hmm. people want, people are going to begin to want more, you know, inter, better edu entertainment and better educational information because, you know, I think they're, they're worn out on the nonsense. And that's going to be the new wave of creating a position of influence. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Uh, so uh, I guess one point I, I'm drawing from this um, just from like an actor's standpoint is that like a lot of what uh, actors do in Hollywood these days is not really act. They're just kind of being themselves, reading the lines. Uh, whereas like you go back, you know, 50, 60 years um, or you don't even have to do that. You could, like Daniel Day Lewis, like he really gets into character for each role yeah. that he's in. 
Um, whereas, um, like, uh, like Kevin Hart, um, he's pretty much Kevin Hart in all of his movies. Like, so you, you, it kind of seems like the transition is away from, you know, acting where you're taking on the persona of whatever role you're playing and rather just like, Ooh, I like seeing, uh, this guy that I like, you know, in this part rather. Yeah. Well, I think the great ones. You know, I think the great ones, you know, are, sometimes they're a little, there's a little something different about them. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, and if you have something different, you know, dive into that. Don't dive away from it. You know, because mm -hmm. I think society makes people dive away from who they truly are. But if you have something that's a little different, make that difference bigger because uh, my experience, you know, the great ones you put them on camera it's like a light switch and they can just go mm -hmm. you know and a lot of people mm -hmm. don't you know like eddie murphy a lot of people don't know that all the movies that eddie murphy made never talked to the director you know he would only take and heard advice. About that. he would only take advice from his through his manager because he was somewhat of an introvert you know he's a little off you know but you didn't see that you didn't see that on camera, but mm -hmm. that made who he is today. Yeah. You know? And he, he was true to himself. So I think more people got to be true to themselves and dive deeper in who you really are. And, you know, if you can make that work, then you're on to something. And, and kind of going along with that point, um, you know, being true to yourself, uh, I, I kind of wanted to talk about like, uh, like sort of YouTube and like uh, how it's kind of uh, changing a lot of things around because you'll have just, you know, regular people that, you know, start garnering like millions of followers, uh, you know, for whatever their content is, be it like, um, like PewDiePie, who was uh, sort of the first major YouTube sensation guy. He played video games um, or like, you know, uh, I watch a lot of like car mechanic shows uh, on like, it's just like all this just tidal wave of content. That's like, you can really just find whatever niche you're interested in and kind of, you know, delve into it and, you know, get to know these people. Cause like they're creating hundreds and hundreds of hours of content that you'd never have access to for like a movie star. So it's, it's kind of interesting to see how that's um, kind of moving the needle in terms of the, uh, uh, I guess the customization of what content people find. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of how I created my, my, I mean, I'm basically a, I'm basically a micro studio, you know, mm -hmm. my motto is, yeah. um, you know, when Clint Eastwood went into Paramount, they had everything in house and, you know, if someone signs with us, I can, I can operate like Hollywood cause I have everything in house. I have production, I have marketing, I have PR. Everything is in my universe because I've created a position of influence in my universe. Um, and, and that's, you know, and that's a big deal. And I think if you look at when I when I looked at Silicon Valley in Hollywood and realized that they don't communicate very well. But I'm like, hey, if I can get out front of this and I can take elements of Silicon Valley, elements of Hollywood and combine, right, with production value right? The speed of Silicon Valley and what comes out the other end, that's the future of entertainment. So going to what you just said, you know, a lot of these creatives are going to have, you know, things are moving so fast. They're going to have to start to understand how to produce content faster to mm -hmm. keep up. Or by the time my people like my daughter is 30 years old, you know, you know, these kids are not even going to pay attention to anything it's in hollywood yeah you know what i'm saying because they're they're not they're not understanding the speed of how you need to create and how things are being communicated in the real world they're still living in a bubble mm -hmm. you know and that bubble bubbles making everybody lose jobs um, yeah yeah no kidding <laughs> yeah and I, 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 <laughs> seriously <laughs> i i, I, I <laughs> I, I, I think like uh, TikTok uh, is pretty much like the uh, the best example of that because it's just millions and millions of people uh, watching billions and billions of videos and they're just like 
real short clips and uh, it's got eyeballs on it for hours and hours a day. I, I think like the typical TikTok user um, watches it for like four hours a day or something. something like, yeah, three and a half to yeah. four hours a day. Yeah. I mean, you could sit down, even if you didn't have a job, they were saying that you were telling me that on an article you had read a while back, right? That if you sat down and watched all the content just on YouTube that was on YouTube right now, you wouldn't be able to do it in a time. Oh, like that's no. just that's how much there was. And this is from years ago. Yeah. You know, that's that's taking out any content that's on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, well, so TikTok, TikTok to me is a cheap trick. Yes. Yes. It's, absolutely. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's the Don King of social media. TikTok. Amen. Yeah. Amen. It, it really is. And and it's great for the consumer. But for the creators, it's not great. Because no. there's so many bots on that system mm -hmm. that their conversion for ads and stuff like that is why nobody makes any money off the platform. Mm -hmm. They're just trying to garner, yeah. you know, a position based on nonsense. And I think they, you know, I think if they pick and choose if they want to break somebody or not, there's no mm -hmm. true algorithm with them. And that's why they're having problems now with conversion and so forth. And I, and I think uh, the government's probably going to get rid of them anyway. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. And I, I would even argue that it's TikTok is not really good for the consumer because uh, I don't know. I, I, I think that I agree. Yeah. But, you know, we are, we are yeah. all lambs, you know, and we follow. So we're going to dive deep into the bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's sad isn't it but it's fucking true it really is you want like you we want to we want to you know take the rose colored glasses off for a second and you know spit yeah. some truth uh so john if you could say out of all of the platforms youtube instagram whatever which one is the most critical for someone looking to become i guess for lack of better words, famous, I guess at this point, which one has the most influence? I know YouTube has the largest reach, but are there, is there one that it's just more successful with helping people get noticed? Uh, Facebook and Facebook and Instagram is your money maker. Really? Have, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm surprised by that. Yeah. Cause you're going to have you, you know, I even met with uh, Jimmy Allen. I was okay. in Nashville. Mm -hmm. and I was just talking to him about social media and you know, you know, he said the same thing. He said, yeah, he says he agreed with me. He said that there are some people, you know, broke through TikTok, but your real value and conversion for ticket sales is through Instagram and Facebook, you know, because, oh. it, it, yeah, because okay. Facebook, what people don't realize is about Facebook, Facebook's back in is the future of advertising and nobody else. That I've heard many times. Back in. So whatever <laughs> Facebook does on the surface they still have the advertising back end technology that's far beyond anybody else in the marketplace. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Man. Okay. Cause nobody's, you know, cause nobody's looking up at the billboards anymore, you know, and yeah. everybody's looking at their phones and the best marketing system structure Facebook has. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So when you're trying, when you guys sign a new talent and you're trying to kind of pump them up and get their name out there, what platforms do you guys typically use? Are there any tricks of the trade that, I don't know, for a listener that's curious about starting off on their own, you might recommend for them? I mean, I, you know, I'll start with Facebook. You know, I spend some money. I push, push the talent out to the world. The Facebook see who, post. Okay. See who, see who responds, right? And then I look at cost uh cost per click right yeah the you paper know? ppc okay yeah. cost per click is a big deal because i you know in interaction rate so i know that if i could have someone like i have this program called crowd tangle and it would show me an interaction rate so i know if i get say twenty thousand fans compared to a page that has three million and I and I look at that interaction rate. If I if I know that someone ha has twenty thousand fans, the interaction rate is higher than someone who has six million fans. I know at that point it's just a numbers game because mm -hmm. the interaction rate is higher than the six million page. Right. So interaction rate is a telltale sign of how to industrialize fame. 
But that's basically what I did. I industrialized fame with data, mm -hmm. you know, with the right talent. Like I said, you can't, you know, like I said, it takes talent first. But I, if, I, if it hits the right numbers and the interaction rate is very high, it's just a numbers game at that point. So you're you're basically Moneyball, but for uh, like Hollywood <laughs> actors. <is> what I <laughs> yeah. <hear. laughs> yeah, hey, and the thing, you know, the thing about it is, everybody in Hollywood knows who I am and knows my company, but they and they quietly watch, and I think I piss them off all the time because they're like this son of a bitch, <laughs> you know, because they they're they're never going to admit what I'm doing and how I'm doing it is you know the future mm -hmm. you know if you will um because you know these guys have built an industry in the past 20 30 years it's that's a lot of crow to eat somebody comes in the game and changes it they're not they're not going to acknowledge that at all mm -hmm. so what are you guys what are you guys what is your company doing specifically that's different from the competition to Get these, get your clients' names out there, or your your projects' names out there. What are you guys doing differently? I mean, I do things. I mean, I'm an oddity because I do things by feel. Sure. You know, being a, I'm basically they call me the reluctant shaman. You know, so I do <laughs> things by feel. You know, I, I'm a natural healer and all this, and and uh, I don't know. I just think I have a rationale. I'm able to rationale things a little different than most people, mm -hmm. and that rationale is simple you know i think simple is better you know um you know if if it, if you see a duck and it quacks like a duck it's a duck if that makes sense i'm not trying to sell you know i'm going to build something that's authentic that's the difference i'm going to build something that's authentic i'm not going to sell you a bill of goods with mm -hmm. anybody that's in my camp you know and i think to some extent sometimes hollywood you know creates these people who may or may not be able to hold water yeah. at the end of the day and then they go away they use them and they go away yeah so i try to create authenticity i think yeah. is the biggest thing and, and it goes back to that casting call that's done for me that casting call tells me if i can be authentic with a talent at a major level yeah. you know everything i do is data driven everything right and, if you, and it's especially, yeah, in today's day and age, data and analytics drives really most things. It's not even just the entertainment industry, obviously. Um, and it's safe to say at this point, yeah, obviously, social media, it's taken the place of, you know, commercials on television shows as the main way of advertising that people see and obtain all their information on events happening in the future, you know, movies coming out, concerts coming to town, whatever, uh, letting us know who the, the newest hot celebrity is or the newest hot take. Um, where I, I, I just want to hit, I, I don't want to interrupt you, I want you to finish your talk, but just that yeah. authenticity, I have the record with AEG Global, um, which is AEG Global, if you don't know AEG, AEG Global and Live, uh, Live Nation are two biggest mm -hmm. yeah. live uh people in the business live event yeah okay. um live entertainment people in the business i i right. have the record of selling five thousand tickets with aeg global and the venue spent 44 dollars wow wow how the hell did it's good wow. so let, let me let me guess why you were able to do that because i want to see if i've learned anything yeah okay <laughs> so they only had to spend 44 dollars because the show or the act you were putting on um, had really uh, loyal fans that were engaged, so they found it themselves. Well, we we had to, we marketed ourselves, but because okay. we, but we because we created a pure source, right? That had no <clears throat> bullshit numbers. I built, and the other thing is, I you know, the other thing is, a lot of people have fake numbers out there in Hollywood, and that conversion. Um, that conversion that dilutes the com what they don't understand that dilutes the conversion, right? So if I take someone that has a million number, supposedly a million fans, and let's say they bought three hundred thousand of them, mm -hmm. then you add the algorithm, then you add the the pure fan compared to a hundred thousand people that was built authentically. We didn't buy any numbers. The conversion with that dilution and that million fan base is stronger with a hundred thousand people 
than it is with a million because they bought 300,000 of the, of the fans. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense because you're actually getting real people really involved rather than just, you know, throwing some money down to pad the numbers. Yeah. And selling air. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly. can, can, can we get you to work for the federal reserve no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i don't um, think he wants that headache <laughs> <laughs> uh so where where i guess to, to piggyback off from what i was saying earlier where do we where do you guys think we're going to be in 10 years with social media in the entertainment industry where where do you think the i mean the effect on it has obviously already grown significantly within the last five years, just in the last five years, in the last half decade, it's obviously gotten so much stronger. You know, we're viewing a lot of our content in some cases for most people, most of their content through social media. What do you guys think 10 years from now, where are we going to be at? Well, if you look at, you know, if you look at what you have in your backyard, I mean, you have, you have people leaving Hollywood and you have a Joe Rogan who's a yeah. power. <laughs> in your backyard creating his own universe. Yep. <laughs> I think you're going to see more and more of that, you know, as we move forward okay. in the future. So more of the metaverse kind of stuff. Yeah. So if you if if you want to win out there, you better start getting some land on social media to establish your position of influence because I think that's going to be a trend as we move forward. Mm. What do you mean when you say land you need to get some land for your presence on social media? What do you mean? Can you elaborate on that? Well, I, th I think it's still like the wild, wild west. I think we got another five years of being the wild, wild west. Okay. And, you know, when regulation, like garnering a position, like the internet, let's say if the internet is the earth, right? We're going to the metaverse. I think that's 10 years away. Yeah. Right. So if you can garner as much space and build a big enough fan base, right? on social media and garner a position before regulations and things come down in the next five to 10 years, mm -hmm. that's the position you need to be in. Because if you don't get in now, it's going to be harder to build that position of influence later, you know, if you wait, you know, and it goes back to that, that talent that, you know, it could be an amazing talent, but if you don't have numbers, you could be the best talent nobody ever sees. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just think about that and do the work, all right? If you really want to do something, do the work and, and get out there and be seen. Yeah, it really is. I mean, especially back in the day, it really was all about luck. It really was about all who you knew. You know, I had a good friend of mine who's he's been acting in New York for Jesus. I mean, what, 15 years at this point, he said the greatest actor to ever live either hasn't been discovered yet, hasn't been born yet or has already died. We probably haven't seen them or may never see them because they just won't ever be discovered. And it really got me thinking. And he was like, you know, it's quite possible. It's, you know, with billions of people on Earth, you know, and the billions more that are about to are about to come on out. Uh, it's possible. It really is. Uh, no, Gary, I 100 percent agree. I mean, I, 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 I'll say this and I'm y'all might probably want to get off here, but I don't know. I've been on here. We've been on here. I don't know how long y'all do your podcast, but. Oh, um, yeah, we're, we're about to we're usually for like an hour and a half, but we're at the end of the itinerary. So we're basically done. Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, I was going to say, I agree with you 100% with what you just said, because I've seen some of the greatest stage act comedians in New York City. Really? Nobody, oh. knows. Mm -hmm. and nobody knows them because they have no following. And they, are, yeah. they crush it on stage. Yeah. But yeah, th there's no one to market for them or advertise for them. They need you, basically. <laughs> they, 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 you need, they need to hire bank productions. <laughs> they do. They, I mean, they do, but you know, they don't want to eat crow either, you know, so it's uh, hopefully I can just, you know, pave a way um, and, and teach. I just want to teach, you know, I just want to teach humanity some some stuff that can improve people's lives and, um, you know, have a voice because being famous really is just having a voice in the community. And what you do with that voice is very important. Sure, sure. Uh, so this kind of brings us into our, our the, the last question of the night that I wanted to chat about real fast uh, before we wrap up. Um, currently, and I had brought this up really for the last couple of years on the show, I've been talking about this. Uh, I've been talking about me personally working in the film industry in reality TV in, in particular, which is where I make the majority of my, my money. Um, 
with how popular social media content is becoming, with how popular these short videos are becoming um, on any of the platforms we've talked about, I've read plenty of articles where people are very worried about that work in the entertainment industry that let's say the average person has six hours a day or five hours a day to watch whatever they want on their own free time. They spend four hours out of those five hours watching content that regular average everyday people put out on TikTok and Instagram and and YouTube. OK, that last hour is spent watching scripted television. OK, it used to be back in the day that five hours of free viewing time was all spent on movies, documentaries, television shows. So my question to you guys is, are we worried about the future of people working in the entertainment industry, people like ourselves, people that are producers or directors or or gaffers or audio mixers? It doesn't matter. Are we worried about there being enough jobs in the future if the majority of content people are watching is being created by every average day people that are nurses and teachers and their models. I don't know. Does that make sense? Um, I, I'm personally terrified of that. I'm terrified that, uh, you know, if there's a hundred thousand industry jobs available in America today, I'm worried in 10 years, there's going to be like 20,000, you know, cause there's just going to be so much less work for us to be able to do. Cause everyone's going to be watching fucking TikTok videos. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's an addiction and tech, you know, I, I talk about tech health, health and how to manage oh. your kids on tech health, you know, oh. and manage your kids on social media. So I, I think if we can have start creating a little better management, right. And then, and then understand that there's been no management on social media. And when people start to realize that it's really affecting people's lives, it's creating anxiety, you know, in kids and so forth, because, you know, and I and I'll get to the end of this with your answer, but when you think about it, you know we have senses. We can see, we can smell, we can taste, we can hear. So, and you can see this playing out in society. So, when you have a kid, and and this is why the metaverse is ridiculous. But when you have a kid that's keeping most of their time right here, and they're in there, there's no emotion in their decision. It's swipe left, swipe right. And you're not utilizing your senses the right way. So now they've lived this way through their teens. They get into their 20s. So when they have these experiences and, and, and they have these emotions that hit them, it's an overreaction, right? And you see this playing out in society with pretty much everything. It's an overreaction because they don't, they've never felt this before. That's the problem. So I think if we can start educating better, Right. And, and make people understand the management of these phones and that technology and then go back to this uh, traditional uh, model of entertaining and figure out how we create a hybrid model. Right. That these great creatives can still operate. I think eventually we will get there. Yes, mm -hmm. some jobs are going. There's going to be a swing in jobs and so forth. But I think. Once there's better education about social media and people start to realize what it's doing to people, that's going to change a little bit. So it's still going to leave the door open for, I think, great talent that's that's in the creative space. Watch out at some point. I, I completely agree with you. At some point, watch out social media history or things connected to it. It's going to be a degree plan for colleges at some point here coming up, if it isn't already. I, 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 gen I truly do believe that. Um, yeah. It scares the crap out of me. I mean, you, I mean, you and you guys are the guys that's got to create that space, you know. And I think the more you experience, I think some, you know, I think we're going into a better place of of a human. I think we're going to we're we're eventually going to go to a better place of the human human experience. Believe it or not, I think sure. there's a transition right now. So you know, just stay true and and thing stay true to yourself, and things will work out. Yeah. Amen. Amen, man. Uh, cool. Thank you so much for joining us this week, John. Uh, really quick, uh, I know here that we're, we're wrapping up, but Gary and I normally uh, give recommendations on either a movie, documentary, TV series, whatever, maybe even a new comedian uh, for our listeners to check out for the week. Uh, just kind of some fun recommendations for them to 
take with them uh, from the show. So um, we'll give you a second. Uh, it can be anything, preferably something that's related to the topic, but it's up to you. Um, I was just going to go ahead. I'm going to throw out, uh, let give a take out to the social network. Um, just a fantastic, uh, I know it's an old one, but fantastic David Fincher film, uh, Jesse Eisenberg. Justin Timberlake, Andrew Garfield, a fantastic story about the uh, creation of Facebook and uh, the subsequent events that led to the creation of the, I I guess, the tyrannical Zuckerberg. So, you know, however you want to view him, (laughs) that's up to you. But that's my recommendation for the week. He works with Meta. Let's not call Zuckerberg tyrannical. (laughs) Uh, Well, (laughs) Zuckerberg wants to find me again. (laughs) Well, I will say this. He, he, uh, when he walked out of Congress, what's the tape? When he walked out of Congress, he walked very Hitlerish. It was very strange. <laughs> he walked out like a robot. I said, "Is this some bitch an alien?" He's a lizard person. I He's a lizard person. Yeah, <laughs> it's the Imperial March. He's yeah, done, done. Uh, Gary, what about you? What are you recommending this week? Uh, uh, that, <laughs> that analogy, but it was kind of odd. Well, since we were talking about like the disconnect of people uh, from, you know, other people in this episode, like, you know, just watching, uh, you know, looking at their phones all day and not have handling their emotions well, I would like to recommend the uh, film The Banshees of Inishirin, um, which is a uh, it's a lovely take about two. Well, one friend and one person that doesn't want to be his friend and how they survive that uh, uh emotional time in their lives another martin mcdonagh movie very very good if you like if you're an in bruges fan or a fan of seven psychopaths check it out well i i have something that's top of mind yeah please top of mind he's in your backyard he was on my podcast joe vital dr joe vital the mm-hmm. secret okay you want to grab yourself i think that thing came out i don't know it was a documentary they spent three million dollars on a documentary gross 65 wow. million but if Not you a bad return. <laughs> no. <laughs> if you want to learn about metaphysics and how to ground yourself as a human being, that's a good start. All right. Nice. Have to check it out. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, awesome. Uh, so, John, was there anything else that did you, please, did you want to plug your podcast or your book really quick? Or um, I don't uh, yeah, think I mean, the, the name. The un- you know, check out the Unimpressed podcast. I mean, I, I uh, have a lot of great guests on there, a lot of human experience type of people like Rita Gigante, who was um, Vincent Gigante, the, Vincent the Chin Gigante, oh. uh, who uh, Vincent mm-hmm. was head of uh, the Genovese Crown family, who was head of the syndicate, who Rita grew up in a mob family, who was a medium, psychic, you know, spiritual person. Um you know, I had uh, uh, Dr. Bradley Nelson, who wrote the book, The Emotion Code. You know, uh, we, we try to I try to do things a little different on the podcast. I try to interview people from the ground up and create micro moments that are relatable to human beings. So it can be very, very educational. So check out the Unimpressed podcast. And then if you want to check out my company, Bang Productions, it's bangproductionstv.com and we have a big Southern Mama and Friends comedy tour taking off this year. Uh, we got 20 big city shows, so check that out as well. But I, I enjoy talking to you guys. And, you know, yeah, man. Absolutely. Yes, thank it was you. It's a pleasure. Yeah, man. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, guys, John Edmonds Cosma, thank you so much, John, once again. It was an absolute pleasure. Uh, if you're interested in checking out any of uh, Bang Productions content or any of John's content, uh, we will have the links for you guys uh, located at the bottom of our description for this week's episode. Uh, so for all of us here at I Don't Give a Flick, I'm Johnny. I'm Gary. And Neil will be joining us next week. Uh, stay classy. Thank you for tuning in to Lead Feather Productions' podcast of I Don't Give a Flick. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast so that you never miss an episode. Podcasts are available on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and everywhere podcasts are hosted. I Don't Give a Flick is hosted and produced by Johnny Blackburn, Gary Elmore, and Neil Riley. Executive producer, Johnny Blackburn. Technical director, editor, and audio mixer, Gary Elmore. I Don't Give a Flick is a Lead Feather production. Copyright Lead Feather Productions.